Hello, everyone. It's John Pushkar. I'm here again today to bring you some information that hopefully will keep you safe in the world of fuels and combustion equipment safety. Today's a special episode. Today, I'm kind of departing from the norm. I'm coming to you to discuss circumstances that unfortunately are in our world, things like the hack that occurred on the Colonial Pipeline. I want to discuss how these sorts of things can happen with fuel-fired systems, combustion equipment, in both large industrial facilities and maybe in some smaller industrial facilities, in some commercial or institutional facilities. I'm here today with the two smartest people I know that are in that space. I'm here today with my son, Zachary Pushkar. Zachary served in a signal intelligence battalion in the Marine Corps. He's a combat veteran of Afghanistan and he's also a certified information systems security professional. Zach does this kind of work professionally for a large institution here in town, and he's been gracious enough to give me some of his lunch hour time for this topic. I've also got Eric Slack. Eric and I have worked together for the past 25 years. Eric is an expert in the area of PLC control systems and industrial controls in general. So we want to talk to you a little bit today about experiences both of these gentlemen have had in this space. And we just kind of want to give you some general thoughts, some directions to look at if this is a topic that you now want to consider or that you've been asked to consider. Over the last 40 years, I've developed and led fuels and combustion equipment safety programs for the largest manufacturers in the world. Today, I'm bringing you knowledge, insights, and best practices about fired equipment and natural gas safety. Over the next few minutes, you'll get the kind of practical, real-life explanations that I've become known for. So folks, let me lay out a little background for you. When, when people do attacks like this, there's several different levels or places where the attack can take place. You can attack the commercial systems, which have to do with the ability to conduct commercial transactions, maybe the billing space or the metering space, for example, in the Colonial Pipeline. You could choose to attack the equipment itself, which might be a PLC system like Eric works on all the time that's actually connected to a server. In fact, Eric, let's take that topic up for just a second. You and I discussed that in some of the pre-work we did for this session. So Eric, one of the things we talked about was that one of the defenses for this, if someone would get in and actually hack a PLC program is, you could dump the program and reload the new program, right? Reload a version that you had saved. Eric, tell me about how that seems to happen in large sophisticated facilities versus facilities that maybe aren't so large or aren't so sophisticated? A lot of the bigger facilities like a GM or a Ford or Honeywell, they'll have server-based backups where it automatically goes out once a day, twice a day, how it depending on the operation and automatically pull the PLC program and store it. That way, if they do get compromised, they can just download it from the server. Some of the sites, the smaller facilities don't have a backup system. They rely on their maintenance people or somebody to physically go out and make a copy. And that doesn't always happen. So a couple of places I were there or was visited, they had some big problems. They didn't have backups. So tell me about uh, kind of a horror story you might've walked into regarding backups. There was a paint facility their actual hot program got compromised. They went to get their backup and it wasn't there. I happened to have one that I had made like six months prior. So it wasn't accurate for what they had that day, but at least it got them up and going. But it cost them a lot of time. It probably cost them four hours of downtime. Thank you. Certainly not something you'd like to repeat on a regular basis. <laughs> no. So one of the pieces of advice we might give people is if you're one of these less sophisticated facilities, you want to have some readily available backup on hand. And maybe you want to start a practice of regularly backing up and actually having someone who knows where that is. 
Eric, what is it that you're finding security-wise when you go into these facilities these days? I know in the old days, we'd walk in with laptops, we'd connect up and we would do our thing. How has some of that changed? Larger facilities have workstations set up at the sites. The workstations can either get to multiple services or individual boilers or process equipment. If you try to go use the USB port on a lot of these stations, they're disabled. They don't want people using USBs. That's where a lot of viruses and malware gets added. They also, if you do have a site where you have to get online with your own PC or your own uh, laptop, they'll have you go to IT. They'll test it for viruses or malware before you're even allowed to take it into the site. A lot of the smaller sites, I mean, they don't have that, the IT department, so they don't have the protections that these larger sites have. Gotcha. So basically on some of the medium and smaller sites, you're seeing almost nothing? Yeah, you basically walk on with your laptop and go to work. They don't, they're, you know, they don't check anything. So yeah, they, gotcha. they're pretty vulnerable. Gotcha. Thank you. Hey, Zach, can you give us an idea maybe of, of some of the basic framework of things that people might want to be doing in this space just to kind of maybe harden their facilities a little bit? So data backups are going to be the primary mitigation against ransomware in a lot of these situations. As we've seen with the, the recent attack in the news, even when provided with the decryption tool, the victim party ended up using their own backups to restore services anyway. So having good backups, especially if you have an opportunity to make sure that those backups are air gapped from the rest of your systems, because, because an attacker might also compromise those backups as well. It is best if you are able to keep those backups in a secure location. Some uh, organizations even go so far as to keep their backups geographically separated in case of an earthquake or a fire or natural disaster at their primary site, they are still capable of backing up from their secondary site. Wow, I, I never thought of the whole idea of compromising someone's backup. And you mentioned the attack that was in the news recently. Can you take us through how one of these things actually really happens in real life, maybe from even the first contact? What happens is, is they compromise your network, they copy off, whatever sensitive data they can find, and then they lock you out of it. Typically, they'll send you a ransom letter, whether it's an email or actually leave something on your system as a ransom note, and they'll demand that you pay them X amount of money. And typically, that whatever amount that they quote will automatically double every 24 hours until it's paid. So in that time, your team's typically scrambling around trying to figure out how you were compromised, who you need to report to, if you have backups, the data, all these kinds of things. And meanwhile, your ransom is getting ready to double by the end of the day. So uh, if you do pay the ransom, however, they, they'll typically send you a decryption tool to start unlocking your data. But th those decryption tools are slow. Sometimes the attackers might actually break the data accidentally, ruin the integrity of the data. So in my opinion, it's hard to even really trust that data once it's restored. You shouldn't rely on that tool. You should rely on your securely stored backups to restore your data if possible. Gotcha. We know of what was in the news and frankly, that was a big deal to the entire United States and millions of people. But Zach, you and I have a common colleague that uh, we know this happened to that frankly was at a relatively small architectural firm and it was crippling to this uh, gentleman that I know that ran this architectural firm for 35 years. And at the end of the day, despite him having lots of IT people involved and the FBI and lots of other people, he ended up paying just as the pipeline facility ended up paying. So it's a very tough situation. And I think this is certainly a case where an ounce of prevention is worth 10 or 20 pounds of cure. Eric, that brings me to another point. In our world, Eric, in our space, and the space I'm speaking about with Eric is this fuel-fired equipment combustion system space, large industrial furnaces, ovens, boilers, things like that. 
One of the things we talked about was making the fuel train system robust in case someone actually did get in. And Eric, I started to touch on with you earlier that that kind of means putting in separate safety systems that I'll use Zach's term that are air gapped from the PLC and the other controls. Maybe that's a separate high steam pressure limit that's on a little single loop controller that's not tied into anything. Maybe it's a high temperature limit the same way. Have you got any thoughts about trying to protect these kinds of industrial systems in that environment? There's, there's several ways to do it. Some of the larger facilities will have a separate network for the PLCs and the floor equipment. And then it'll have a bridge between that network and the outside network. So it's actually, like you said earlier, it's, it's air capped or has a separation. Password protection, and then giving the outside access only to monitor, not to make changes. You know, I remember when going to certain industrial clients, you would know, and I won't mention them by name, your tools would be a pair of channel locks and a couple of screwdrivers. Now they're a laptop. And it scares me to think at how over automated some of these sites are for no reason. So there are a number of major vendors that are advocating more and more network control, more and more data sharing and analysis of that data. I, I think the trend is heading more that way. Are you thinking that in some cases people are over automating? Yes, I think that a lot of the uh, remote access that people want is not necessary and that it makes the process and the company more vulnerable to hackers. A lot of people want remote access, they want their fingertips on everything. And a lot of it I don't think is necessary. So we're getting to the point where that pendulum might have swung too far for everyone's <laughs> own good. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks again. So fellas, we both understand the big trends that are happening in the world today, the kind of the mega trends of working from home and things are being asked to be accessed more remotely. In fact, I will tell you guys, I'm on the NFPA 85 Boiler Combustion Hazards Code Committee, and I made a number of public comments surrounding something that's in there. In, in that code today are discussions and requirements for how you do remotely operated and remotely accessed boiler room facilities. There are a number of states, like the state of Minnesota, for example, has a form that you fill out as an application for constructing and having a remotely accessed boiler facility. Frankly, I don't know that any of it addresses questions related to this topic. Zach, can you give us some insights into this whole world of more people working at home needing to remotely access things and how that works in the cybersecurity world or how it doesn't work? I believe there are a lot of issues where um, you'll see small organizations uh, put, put controllers or servers directly on the internet that don't need to be connected directly on the internet. Those types of devices should be behind a firewall and a VPN that remote workers would connect to a VPN to get to a secure internal network to access those sorts of devices. Setting up a, a secure VPN for your site is not a very high level of effort solution to, to reap a lot of rewards for security to prevent attackers from accessing your systems um, directly and remotely. Another important, uh, critically important thing here would be security awareness training. I feel that uh, the vast majority of these types of attacks can be mitigated by appropriately training users to identify, report, and prevent cyber attacks even at home for, for remote workers. So is that like phishing attacks, you know, emails? Yeah, that... that'd, be, that'd be things like phishing, uh, appropriate usage of, of devices, understanding, even simply understanding how to connect to the appropriate resources and, and remote networks, being able to recognize uh, signs of compromise, indicators of compromise on your, on your machines, a variety of, of things would be involved with security. How to report an incident if you see an incident, you know, that's, that's one thing people don't think about as much as if you sitting on your computer and you you files start getting locked and machine starts acting funny and and you can you you see that you've potentially been compromised 
do you know in your organization who to contact and do they have playbooks written for how to how to react to that and how to contact the appropriate authorities a lot of places don't that, that that's an excellent point in fact eric in our in our prep talks for this episode you you said something about apparently people can get compromised through emails zach how do people in this space how would they compromise someone with an email so there's a few different way attack vectors for for email or phishing attacks employees are really used to having some sort of login portal in the morning when they they log in they they put in their user username and password into a a portal somewhere and they log in and access their their email or or their day-to-day -day business tools attackers will actually clone your company's specific login page or login portal and then they'll send you a link the email could say hey there because of the recent attack in the news uh, everybody needs to update their passwords please go to this login portal and and update your password and you'll go there and it'll look just it'll look identical to your company's login page except there might be a couple different typos in the url and they'll have you put in your username and password and they'll capture that that password on the way and if your credentials have access to sensitive applications or controls or, or, or sensitive data they'll abuse that to to steal data so that's that's one method. Another method is it could be simply sending a malicious file that looks like a PDF or a Word document or a DocuSign document, something like that that has malicious software in the uh, the the attachment. It's typically something with that'll try to um, give you a sense of urgency. They'll say, you know, hey Joe, I need you to I need you to to reply to this. PDF questionnaire that was sent to us by noon today, and it'll look like it comes from your boss. You, you double click on that, it executes code, it'll compromise your machine. And, and one problem that can stem from those types of compromise is uh, a lot of times people don't even know what their credentials can actually access on the back end. You know, you'll, you'll have your login and you believe that it can only get to the couple things that you get to every day. But you don't realize that that your account may have uh, much more than the least privileged access necessary in your system, and those credentials could be abused in in all kinds of different places across your network. Gotcha. Thank you very much. V very valuable information. I appreciate it. Well, listen. I think one of the trends that's occurring today to combat this is people are doing cyber-focused PHAs, process hazard analyses. And there's lots of, you could Google it, there's tons and tons of people offering the service. There are people that participate in these who are primarily IT staff. There's people like Zach who are security professionals. Eric and I would be valuable people to have in that room because we know the work end of this. We know the combustion fuel train controls PLC end of this. That's how we can help. If you're going to be doing something like that for your organization, you want your PLC control systems, combustion systems evaluated for this kind of threat, that's where we could help. I want to thank you two gentlemen for participating today. We've put some very valuable information out there. I know that will help a lot of people. Once again, thank you both very much for participating. Hopefully you found something here of value that you can pass on to friends or coworkers. If you can, please hit the like button and share this video. And I'd also like to invite you to the Prescient Technical Services Online School, where you'll find more than 20 modules that I've created from knowledge I've acquired over the past 40 years, traveling over 3 million miles and being in and out of more than 300 industrial plants in 12 different countries. So once again, thank you very much for being here. It's my mission to pass on important life-saving information. I'll be releasing one of these videos just about every week. And if you could subscribe in the link below, I'll make sure that you get first notice of every time a new video comes out. Once again, thank you and please have a safe day.